Dr. Neil Barnard is a leader in nutrition and research as an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University and researcher funded by the National Institutes of Health, he has led key, re key research studies to improve the health of people with diabetes, obesity, lipid disorders, and other serious health problems. His research has been cited by the American Diabetes Association and the American Dietetic Association in official policy statements on healthful diets. Dr. Barnard completed med school, medical school and residency at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and in 1985 founded the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a nationwide group of physicians and lay supporters that promotes preventative medicine and addresses controversies in modern medicine. He is a New York Times bestseller of over 20 books on uh, health for lay readers, and I've mentioned to you the wonderful books in the bookstore, so without further ado, it's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Neil Barnard. Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody remember to turn their plots forward. That is so good. All right, well, for all the people who didn't think of it, we've got a lecture called Power Foods for the Brain. Um, you know, you can have all kinds of memory problems. It's, it's a very easy thing to have happen. It starts with a lapse. So you're trying to think of who is that actor in that movie, and, and you can see their face, and you know the title, but you just can't get the name. Or you go to the store, and there's somebody that you know, kind of down at the other end, and you, you duck into another aisle to try to think, what was, what was their name? And of course, there's somebody you know. There, you probably should know. Um, lapses are totally normal. Especially if you're sleep deprived, if you're on a cruise, if you're partying too much. But if it's every day, if it's throughout the day, we call it a condition called mild cognitive impairment. And you're still yourself. You might be able to handle your checkbook, you're probably driving, but you're, you know that your memory is not so hot. And it's especially words and names that you're having trouble with. But if it gets a little bit worse, if you're having trouble learning new material, or remembering things that you've learned, if reasoning and problem solving are getting goofed up, if you have trouble with what's called visual spatial ability, that's if you try to draw a face and you have trouble getting the, what, the different pieces of the face in the right order, or you draw a clock and you get it goofy, that's visual spatial ability. Uh, or if language starts to go, and finally, if your personality is fundamentally changed, doctors look at these five things, and if they're all starting to get impaired, this is where we start to say this could be Alzheimer's. And you'll say, I don't want that. In fact, give me anything other than Alzheimer's disease because that is the last thing I ever want to get because when you've got that, you lose everything. So your doctor will say, well, I'm sorry, it's genetic. Uh, there is a gene, it's called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. And if you got this from one of your parents, your risk is tripled. If you got it from both parents, your risk is 10 to 15 times higher than other people. So what can you do? Get new parents. Well, no, there's, there's nothing you can do. It's just old age and genes, and that's the whole deal. Well, let me share with you a little bit different twist on this story. It gives us a much more hopeful outlook on the brain in general and on Alzheimer's in particular. Let's start with the brain. Um, this will be on the test. See, see that red crescent there? That's, that's the hippocampus, which is Latin for seahorse. Okay, got that? The hippocampus is the center of memory, and it determines what needs to be remembered and what can safely be forgotten. So you're at a restaurant, and the waiter comes up and says, Hi, my name is Kelly. I'll be your server tonight. And the hippocampus thinks, I don't think so. Um, but things that have to be remembered um, that are important, your hippocampus will send them up here to the cerebral hemispheres and code them in memory, which does not mean making new brain cells for every fact, because if it did that, your brain would never fit in your skull. But instead, it means strengthening connections and building new connections between cells, and that's how memory works. So if you look into the brain, though, you start to see some things that don't belong there, like these beta amyloid plaques, 
which are collections of amyloid protein into sort of little meatball shapes. And these are brain cells connecting with each other, and the beta amyloid protein squirts out from the cell, and it collects in these meatballs, beta amyloid plaques. Well, it's a little bit like a sausage maker, this old-fashioned sausage maker, cranking up the protein strands and turning into meatballs and sausage, except that they're in your brain. Well, anybody know what this is? What is this? This is Chicago, that's right. And in 1993, the Chicago Health and Aging Project got started. And they wanted to see if they could track down anything that could help us predict the relationship between food and Alzheimer's disease. And so they brought in thousands of people, and they asked them, what did you have for breakfast? What did you eat for lunch? What snacks did you have? What did you have for dinner? And then they tracked them as the years went by to see who stayed mentally clear and who didn't. And the first thing that they keyed in on, something I knew all about as a kid, when I was growing up in Fargo, my mother had five kids, and we would run down to the kitchen to the smell of bacon frying in the pan. And my mother would be there with a the fork, and she'd take the bacon strips and take them out of the pan and put them on a paper towel to cool down. And then when all the bacon was out of the pan, she had this hot grease left in the pan. And she, you, know, you don't want to throw that away. That's good bacon grease. So she would carefully lift up the pan and pour it into a jar to save it. Did your mother do this too? Yes. So when the jar was filled with grease, she didn't put it in the refrigerator. She just put it on a shelf. Because she knew that when bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It hardens, it solidifies. And you know what? That's a sign that it is very high in what is called saturated fat. You know about saturated fat? What's it doing? That's right, it's bad for your heart. It raises your cholesterol level. Um, but it could also affect the brain. So, by the way, I'll tell you a little tip. If you take bacon grease, is that solid on the shelf? Yes. Is it solid in the refrigerator? Yep, both. If I took, say, uh, peanut oil or corn oil, is that solid on your shelf? No, it's liquid. That's a sign it's high in polyunsaturates. Uh, if I put it in the refrigerator, does it turn solid? No, it stays liquid in there, too. Okay, that's polyunsaturates. Olive oil, on my shelf, what is it? Liquid? Solid. Liquid. In the refrigerator, liquid or solid? Solid. Okay, so saturated fat is solid everywhere. Polyunsaturated oils are liquid everywhere. Monounsaturates like olive oil or canola oil are liquid on the shelf, solid in the fridge. You don't need a lab. Very easy, okay? So the saturated fat, that's what they're keying in on Chicago. The, the main source is not bacon. The main source is dairy products, especially cheese. Number two is meat. And in Chicago, some people eat relatively little saturated fat and some people eat a fair amount of it, and they then look to see who got Alzheimer's disease and who didn't. And can I show you the numbers? There's the group that didn't have very much saturated fat. There's the group that had a lot. Hmm. Their risk of Alzheimer's disease was doubled or tripled or even worse compared to the people who were avoiding saturated fat. So this suggests to us that there is something about this bad fat, but it's not just bad for your heart. It's somehow setting up the brain to have problems with neurological connections. Okay, uh, let's add it up. Let's say I have two eggs. That's about three grams of saturated fat. Let's say I have a strip of bacon. That's another gram. And do you know anyone who has a strip of bacon? Okay, you have two, three, four. All right, so multiply that. Uh, a chicken thigh, and I'm going to take the skin off, and it's four and a half grams of fat. A glass of whole milk, another four and a half grams. Pizza for one, call that 12 grams of saturated fat. Do you know people who eat foods like this? Lots of people eat foods like this. And if you add that up, that puts you in the high risk group if you live in Chicago. Just this sort of normal way of eating, which helps us to understand why we're seeing so much Alzheimer's disease. Because everybody is eating like they're in the high risk group. Okay, so it's not just Alzheimer's. You remember that condition? called mild cognitive impairment. You're still yourself, but your memory is just 
Not right. You're having word problems, name problems every day. Researchers in Finland looked at over a thousand adults. They were 50 years old. They were mentally clear. They looked at their diet, and then they tracked them for the next 21 years to see who developed memory problems. And I want to show you the numbers. First of all, some of them ate relatively little saturated fat. That's this group. Some of them ate a lot more saturated fat. That's that group. And here's the numbers. Okay. So, what this shows us is just like in Chicago with Alzheimer's, the beginnings of memory problems are also associated with, with diet, especially bad fat. Okay, but what about, what about that gene, that APOE epsilon 4 allele that if your parents give it to you, you're condemned? Okay, now I'm going to limit the research to just those people who had just that genetic trait. Some of them had relatively little saturated fat in their diet, some had a lot, and here are the numbers. To understand what this means, that is about an 80% difference in whether you get this disease or not, even if you have the gene. Very important. There are some genes that are dictators. They're in your chromosomes, and if the gene says blue eyes, you are going to have blue eyes. That gene gives orders, and that's going to happen to you. If the gene says brown hair, you're going to have brown hair. That's the way it is. But the genes for Alzheimer's disease are more like committees. They make suggestions. You maybe could get Alzheimer's if you eat a lot of bacon. And these other things. Genes are not destiny. All right? There are some genes that are dictator genes. You can't control them. But we learned this with diabetes. You know, there are genes for diabetes. They run through families. Do you think if you change your diet and you start exercising, you're at the exact same risk as everybody else? No. You can change gene expression. And that's true, we believe, with Alzheimer's. Which gives us an incredible new ray of hope. Who, for those of us who thought it's all genes and old age, there's nothing you can do. Okay, let's go on. Um, oh, what's that? There's fat in there too. Anybody know what the fat is in these snack foods? What do we call it? Trans fats. Yes, exactly. Um, some people in Chicago eat donuts. <laughs> Just a few. And some people don't so much. So here's the low trans fat group in Chicago. Here's the high trans fat. And let me show you the numbers for trans fats. Okay. So, it doesn't have to be bacon grease, and it doesn't have to be cheese fat, saturated fat. It could be trans fats. Partially hydrogenated vegetable oils increase Alzheimer's risk, too. Okay, well, that's good to know. If I skip eating those, maybe that'll be good. All right. By the way, when we're talking about saturated fat, I mentioned dairy, I mentioned meat. Coconut fat is also a heavily saturated fat that is strongly promoted for money reasons, economic reasons, it's as bad as butter. Okay? All right. it's, it's, it's great for polishing your car. Makes your shoes shine really well, puts a little gleam in your hair, don't swallow it. All right, so why? Why would trans fats or saturated fats affect the brain? Short answer, we don't know, but researchers at Kaiser Permanente hypothesize that it could be cholesterol. <coughs> This is the higher you go, or the further you go to the right, this is the higher your total cholesterol. Here's a total cholesterol less than 198. Here's a total cholesterol above 249. And this is Alzheimer's risk. The higher your cholesterol, the higher your blood cholesterol, the higher your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease. And these cholesterols were tested when the participants were 40 years old. In other words, a high cholesterol at 40 predicts Alzheimer's when you're decades older than that. All right? So never too early to change your diet, also never too late. All right? So let's say I'm in Chicago and I'm eating all this stuff. Can I do better? Can I? Can I change my diet? Okay, so here's my risk. Uh, what can I get rid of? Let's see. Um, who's tasted almond milk? Is it good? Yeah. Is it right? Okay. Happens to have zero saturated fat. So I'm going to get rid of this one, bring in the almond milk. Let's see how my risk goes better. If, if the numbers in Chicago apply to me, 
I just cut my risk substantially by throwing out the saturated fat from the milk. Is there something else I can get rid of? Well, or bacon. All right, let's get rid of that. We'll have veggie bacon. It's kind of a liberal interpretation of the original. Um, out with the eggs, in with the oatmeal. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that chicken, to Be gone. Uh, vegetable sandwich. Um, let's see how I'm doing. I'm doing better. Is there something else I can get rid of? What? What do you mean? You can have a pizza with no cheese? That wouldn't be any good, would it? Isn't cheese what makes it good? All right, all right, we'll get rid of it. Let's see, there is the vegan pizza, and let's see how I do. Well, I don't know, because nobody in Chicago eats that well. <laughs> anyway, um, some people do eat that well. At Loma Linda uh, University in California, researchers have studied Adventists. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. And these are, this is cognitive decline in meat-eating Adventists. And as the years go by, one, two, three, four, five, six years, you see their cognitive decline. This is the vegetarians. Now, these are over lacto vegetarians. But just getting away from meat, they're doing better. Now, we don't have comparable data for vegans, but we're going to assume that that curve is better still. OK. So all right, we've been talking about the beta amyloid little meatballs in the brain. And what we're suggesting is that a diet that is high in saturated fat and trans fat is bad for the brain. But there is something else in these plaques. There is cholesterol, and there's also iron and copper. There are metals in your brain. Is that surprising? Let's talk about this. If you had, let's say you had a cast iron pan, and you had a picnic, and then about a week later you realized, oh, I left the cast iron pan on my picnic table, and then it rained last week, and what has happened to your pan? It rusted. And the fact that it rusted is this, that's, a, that's oxidation. The iron is physically changing, it's oxidizing. And if I have a, a nice copper penny, does it stay bright and shiny forever? No, it oxidizes too, it's gradually darkened. That's oxidation. If you eat iron, which there's an iron, there's iron in lots of foods, there's copper in foods too, and you need traces of it. But in your body, it oxidizes. And as iron and copper oxidize, they produce free radicals. And free radicals are little maladjusted chemicals that tear holes in your brain cells. And I think of them as like sparks. That these free radicals that form from having too much iron and too much copper, they singe holes in your skin, causing aging, in your arteries, in your brain. You with me? Okay, so. How many people have a cast iron pin? Now, I'm going to say, if you use it once a month, who cares? If it's your go-to pan and you're frying up stuff in it all every day or a couple times a day, you're getting too much iron in your food. Uh, copper pipes, who's got copper pipes? All right, if the water stays in the copper pipes all night long, and in the morning you fill your coffee maker and drink it, you're getting copper. If you run the water a little bit longer, it'll, it'll get out of there. Um, Meat eaters get lots of iron and lots of copper, especially if they're eating liver, huge amounts of it. Uh, multiple vitamins. Multiple vitamins can be a good thing. They'll give you vitamin B12, they'll give you vitamin D. However, to make you buy them, they will say, we've got everything. We've got all the vitamins and we've got iron. Wait, wait. I'm, I'm eating my green leafy vegetables. I don't need a lot of iron in a pill. Well, we'll give it to you anyway. That pushes you into iron overload. We've also got copper. Wait a minute, there's copper in grains and beans and many foods. I don't need more in my pill. That's okay, we'll throw it in. They throw in iron and copper that you don't need and that will hurt you. Now, the Centrum company makes Centrum Silver. You know about this product? The idea is, okay, you're over 50, you have accumulated so much iron already, we're not going to put any iron in it at all, because you get lots of it in foods. That's good, that was a smart movie. But they're 30 years behind the science, and they still plug lots of copper in there. So if you're taking a multiple vitamin, get one that's called Vitamins Only. There are a few different brands that they just, they leave out the iron and the copper and the minerals. Don't take iron and don't take copper 
unless your doctor has specifically talked to you about why you might need, need that, okay? And frankly, you don't need a multiple vitamin anyway. You do need vitamin B12, and a B12 supplement is really all you need. Or you can take B12 and D if you're taking that too, all right? But you don't need a multiple vitamin. All right, I, has anybody heard about aluminum possibly being linked to this? Yeah. Have you heard people say that aluminum can, can cause Alzheimer's? Yeah. The short answer is we don't, we don't know, but let me show you in a second. started out in England. Researchers looked around and went into 88 counties and tested their water. And some of them had relatively low aluminum content of water. Some of them had high aluminum. Now, as, as the water is coming through the river or comes up from the ground in a well, it really doesn't have aluminum in it. But it has a little bit of mud and grime in it. So at the water filtration plant, they dump in aluminum which helps them precipitate out the solids and makes the water clearer. But then you have to carefully filter out the aluminum or else it comes out your tap, okay? So what they found was that those with the highest aluminum content in their water had a 50% higher Alzheimer's rate. Similar findings in France. And it's also in Canada. So um, if you are unsure about your own water supply, you can go to the EPA's website. The Environmental Protection Agency does list aluminum content of various municipal water supplies. If you are unsure, you can have bottled water, these tanks of bottled water delivered to your home, and they are pretty much all aluminum free, which is good. Um, and you could also get a filter, but the little snap-on filters don't remove aluminum. It's got to be one of these big reverse osmosis filters that goes under your sink. Okay. So it's fine to shower in it, it's fine to bathe in it, but you don't want to drink it if, if it's got a little bit. All right. Now, let me be clear. There are plenty of scientists and doctors who say, I'm not sure I believe that aluminum thing. It may not really be real. Fair enough. That's possible. There are plenty of scientists who are quite concerned about it, and I am concerned for the following reasons. First of all, in industrial accidents, when people who work with aluminum are exposed to high amounts of it, it's a very strong neurotoxin. So we know that it is damaging to the brain. Secondly, when you ingest um, aluminum, your body tries to eliminate it. Your kidneys try to get rid of it as if it's a toxin. But if you take something like Maalox, which is a, an antacid that has a lot of aluminum in it, you can easily overpower that and build up the aluminum in your body. And the last thing is, your body needs iron, it needs copper, it does not need aluminum at all. Your body doesn't use it. So my suggestion is while the scientists are fighting this out, steer clear of it. Don't expose yourself to it. It's very easy to avoid. Okay, we talked about water. Uh, cookware, if cookware is made of aluminum but is coated, has a coating on the surface so the food doesn't touch the aluminum, that's okay. But if the food touches the aluminum, don't use that cookware. All right. Um, if you buy baking powder, on the shelf is that one that has aluminum. Right next to it is that one that is aluminum free. They cost the same. Get that one. Don't buy that one. All right. Um, if you get this pizza, which I hope you won't for other reasons, if you read the label of a lot of, pro of products, look in, in the crust or look in the cheese, they often add aluminum for various reasons. You'll see it written right on the label. Um, if you go into um, a fast food place and they have these little salt or sugar packets, they often add aluminum to keep it from caking when it's humid. Um, Maalox, that, that word, that's magnesium and aluminum hydroxide. You're just drinking aluminum. If you get that one, it doesn't have aluminum. So the choices are there. You can get the aluminum one or the non-aluminum one, okay? If you use a deodorant, it does not have aluminum. If you use an antiperspirant, it does. And it does go through the skin, and it will be marked right on the, the package label that it contains aluminum. So skip that. But use the non-aluminum ones. They're perfectly effective, um, and nothing will happen. All right, so what I've been saying is that metals like iron and copper and maybe aluminum are harmful to the brain. And if free radicals are forming from my iron intake or my copper intake, I need a fire extinguisher to put those free radicals out. And I have one. It's called vitamin E. You know about vitamin E? It's an antioxidant, 
and it's in spinach and mangoes and lots of other foods, especially in the nuts and seeds. And in Chicago, researchers studied vitamin E to see what it would do. And some people had relatively low vitamin E intake. And the theory was, without this antioxidant, they would not be protected against free radicals. Some people have more vitamin E, and the theory was maybe they would be protected a little bit against free radicals. And here are the numbers. Okay, that's the way it worked out. So the people with a high vitamin E intake had, what, less than half the risk of getting Alzheimer's compared to people who are neglecting their vitamin E. What we think is happening is that it's simply neutralizing free radicals that form in your body. All right? So it's in all these foods, broccoli and spinach and sweet potatoes, healthy foods, and in much higher quantity in the nuts and the seeds. Okay? But one danger is that these foods are pretty fatty, and you can easily gain weight from eating nut after nut after nut after nut. So here's my suggestion is don't eat them. What you do is pour them into your hand, and by the time it hits your fingers, that's about an ounce. Okay, so just a small handful, and then don't put it in your mouth. Crumble it up and put it on your salad or on your oatmeal or on your pancakes or something. Use nuts like a flavoring, not like a primary food group, and that way you'll get the vitamin E that you need without overdosing on it. Does that make sense? Okay, very good. Um, now, you can go to the store, and they'll say, forget the walnuts, we've got vitamin E in pills, and why don't you take that instead? And here's why not to. In nature, there are eight different forms of vitamin E. In a pill, there is one, or maybe two. And if you take just one in large quantity, it suppresses your body's absorption of all the others. And in Chicago, the people who took vitamin E pills didn't get any benefit. Why? Because they're taking a lot of one, but it interferes with their absorption of all the others. Don't take vitamin E pills. But if you get it from foods, it works. Okay, make sense? Right. There are some things that are good as pills. Vitamin B12 works fine as a supplement. Vitamin D works fine. Vitamin E, don't take it. Same with beta carotene, don't take it. All right? So, in the Chicago study, the amount that worked, eight milligrams a day, one ounce of nuts or seeds, that's good, got about five, that's one tiny handful. All right? Very simple. simple. Um, all right, Dr. Barnard, I get it. You're saying we should be eating less meat, don't eat the junk food, have natural vegetables and fruits and some nuts. That sounds like a Mediterranean diet. And, okay, uh, in the Mediterranean, there seems like there's less Alzheimer's disease, and maybe that could be, be as a result of um, the alcohol they're drinking. When I was in college, I had some friends who I think they were on the Mediterranean <laughs> diet, apparently, or at least doing their very best to emulate the Mediterranean lifestyle. Um, and it is true that people who are modest wine drinkers have a little bit less Alzheimer's compared to other people in some studies. However, researchers said it may not be the alcohol. It might be the grape that does it. So researchers at the University of Cincinnati said, let's, let's look at that stuff. Let's test that. And what they did is they took Concord grape juice and they brought in a group of people average age 78 years of age. And they all had memory problems. They all had mild cognitive impairment. They were all struggling with words and with names. And they asked them to have a pint a day of grape juice. So that's a cup in the morning, a cup at night. Not hard to do. And then, over the next three months, they tracked their ability to learn new things and their ability to remember compared to a placebo. And it was measurably better in about three months. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, why? Why would that be? Well, the theory is that it's called anthocyanins. <coughs> anthocyanins are pigments in nature. They are the pigments that come out in the fall when the leaves turn. But they are also in dark berries, like grapes, and also in blueberries. So the researcher said, let's go back to the lab. I'm not sure I believe this. Let's test something else. Let's test blueberries. So they did. They brought in a whole new group of people. They all had mild cognitive impairment, average age 76, pint a day blueberry juice, and they got the same result. Same kind of benefit. So my answer is not to have grape juice and blueberry juice or something like that, 
but to build highly colored foods into your routine normally. So the fruits and the grains and the vegetables and the legumes should bring their colors to you naturally. Okay, make sense? Think about this for a minute. You go into the store. You can detect at 100 yards beta carotene in the produce department. That's the orange in carrots. It's an antioxidant that will protect you. You can detect lycopene. That's the red color of tomatoes. It's across the room. But you can see in the tomatoes that somebody sliced up in a watermelon, there it is, that's lycopene. You can see the anthocyanins in the blueberries and in the grapes. If you're the other side of the room, you can detect it. Your retina evolved to be able to detect antioxidants. Do you ever wonder why you have color vision? Is this just to make life entertaining? It's because people who didn't have that die. And if you have the ability to detect what's good for you in foods and the brain colors it as positive, nobody ever said, oh, those carrots, my God, keep them away. No, we view those colors as attractive and we bring them into our life. Now, if you go to the store with your cat, your cat doesn't have your color vision. And your cat will say, I don't get it, but what's the big deal? Your, your cat is looking for motion. And so, like, if there's a little mouse on the other end, your cat's gone, okay? Your cat's a carnivore, you're an herbivore. And so we have evolved to be able to detect and be attracted to antioxidants and bring them into our diets. The only problem is the M&M's company uses the same colors. <laughs> and that's like way better than a carrot. Uh, so we have been lured away from what nature was screaming out at us with all these really nice colors. Make sense? Okay, so do I need supplements? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. There are two supplements that I strongly recommend. The first is vitamin B12. And you need vitamin B12 for healthy brain function. You also need it for healthy blood cells. And vitamin B12 is not made by plants, it's not made by animals, it's made by bacteria. And people will say that in the, on the ground or on plants there are traces of B12 producing bacteria. And so before the advent of modern hygiene, you might pick up something out of the ground and eat it and maybe you get traces of B12. Maybe. You can't rely on that source today, if you ever really could. Um, in the intestinal tract of a cow, there are B12 producing bacteria, and that some of the B12 gets in the meat. You have very similar bacteria in your digestive tract, and they make B12 too. But it does not look like human beings absorb B12 from their bacteria because it's produced too far down stream. At least that's what people believe. So my suggestion is that you just take a supplement. And you need about 2.4 micrograms of vitamin B12 per day. Very easy. Uh, all the pills have more than that. Some of them have 10,000 micrograms. Go easy. It's better to take a small amount daily than a heroic amount weekly. Um, and it could be methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin. It doesn't really matter as long as you take it. The thing not to do is to say, wait a minute, I want to be natural and I don't want to take any pills. And if you get B12 deficient, that's not a good idea, okay? One other thing, you need vitamin D. Vitamin D is for what? What's, what's vitamin D for? What's it do? Oh, it helps make bones, that's right. Vitamin D comes from the sun. And the sunlight on your skin causes your body to make vitamin D and um, it will help protect your bones. It also has an anti-cancer effect. Now, for everybody who says, well, I don't want to take supplements at all, I'd rather be natural, keep in mind, you don't live in nature. You live in New Jersey, <laughs> or you live in Pittsburgh, or you live somewhere, and you're probably not getting sunlight all the time. Human beings began in Eastern Africa, and while we were there, there was sunlight all the time, and nobody ever gave lectures saying that you needed to supplement vitamin D, because nobody needed it. But when we had the bad judgment to leave a nice place like Africa and go over the Bering Strait and end up in Toronto or someplace like that, where we're not getting good sunlight, you need vitamin D. And because we wash everything and are totally hygienic, um, you need a source of vitamin B12 too. Don't miss this, because vitamin B12 deficiency, although it's very uncommon, it can happen. And it can manifest as nerve symptoms, and you don't want to have that, because they can be irreversible. Very easy to prevent with vitamin D, uh, vitamin B12. Okay? All right. 
Is that how much? Um, for for vitamin B12, 2.4 micrograms per day. All the pills are more than that. Get the smallest one you can buy. So, but 2.4 micrograms is the amount that an adult needs, and the kid amount is about the same, uh, almost, almost the same. For vitamin D, I would suggest 2,000 international units per day. Now, your doctor will test you, and the doctor will say, man, you're low. Um, for some reason, everybody's low on the test side. I don't quite understand why that is. If it's the testing company, or if it's the supplement manufacturers paying and say they're low. But anyway, then, then they will tell you to go up to 5,000. But most doctors will say 2,000 is enough. All right, so who eats this way? Are there people who avoid bad fats? And are there people who generally shy away from meats and so forth? Well, yeah, there are. This is Okinawa. Anybody ever been to Okinawa? I have a friend who runs a Japanese restaurant. And her mother is from Okinawa. She grew up in Okinawa. It's right down there at the bottom of Japan. And this is Masu. That's my friend's mother. And when Masu was 88, there's a picture. When Masu was 100, there's Masu. There are more centenarians in Okinawa than everywhere, anywhere else. And the dietary staple of Okinawa is not fish. It's not rice. It's sweet potatoes. Huge amounts of sweet potatoes, like crazy. They eat enormous amounts of sweet potatoes. They really don't eat much fish. They don't eat much meat. They don't eat any dairy products. There's no cheesecake in Okinawa. There is no Velveeta in Okinawa. But by the way, when you get to be 100, they throw you a party. Everyone celebrates. But there's a lot of people doing this. And there's a lot of centenarians in Okinawa. Um, this is Ellsworth Ware. He was on a destroyer sailing right by Okinawa. And he didn't know Masu, and she didn't know him, but they ate almost the same way. Okay, uh, Dr. Wareham was a physician, and he grew up, well, let me show you. He, he became quite well known for his service to the US in Vietnam. And he treated lots and lots of kids. And then he was decorated by LBJ, and again by Richard Nixon. Um, but he was a very active surgeon. What was, what was unusual about Dr. Wareham was that when he was a kid, he grew up on a farm, and his parents noticed something unusual about him, is he would not drink the milk. He would go out to the barn and he would bring in the pails of milk, but he would never drink it. And they would say, Ellsworth, why aren't you drinking your milk? And he would say, I saw where it came from. <laughs> and he didn't want to have it. And if it was eggs, that was even worse. So he was vegan from early life. He didn't want any of that kind of unhygienic stuff. He was a very fastidious young man. So when he became a physician, he continued to eat really just simple kinds of food. And as the years went by, he was remarkably healthy. And in fact, when he reached retirement age, 65, he was at his prime. And he said, you know, maybe I'll keep working for a few more years. And he did. And when he hit 70, he said, all right, um, let's see, I think I'm going to keep working for a while, but when I hit 95, I'm going to retire. <laughs> That's what he did. When Ellsworth Wareham was 95, he finally said, I'm not going to be a surgeon anymore, and he, he hung it up. He said, by the way, the other, the other surgeon said, Ellsworth, you're, you're still, you have more knowledge than all the rest of us. You've got steady hands. Why do you keep working? He said, no patient is going to have confidence in a 95-year-old <laughs> surgeon. It's time for me to quit. And he, he, there's Ellsworth Wareham today. Um, and he's, he's still doing surgery, but he does surgery in his backyard on all his plants. He, got the, he has the best sculptured garden you've ever seen. So the point being, there's something about these simple foods and avoiding the unhealthy foods that protects the brain. We're not going to live forever. The body is a fragile thing. Things can go wrong. But nonetheless, there's a tremendous protect, uh, level of protection. OK, <laughs> it's not all food. Exercise is big stuff, too. It's good to take yourself out for a walk every now and then. Um, at the University of Illinois, researchers brought in 120 adults. They all were having memory issues. And they asked them to take a brisk walk three times a week. And that's what they did. And it turned out that it ended up reversing brain shrinkage, especially in the hippocampus, which is Latin for seahorse. Very good, exactly. Um, and it also improved their memory. 
Okay, so exercise is good. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because you're exercising, your blood is flowing, it's oxygenating your brain, it's getting the toxins out. Exercise is a really good thing to do. It doesn't have to be a lot. Brisk walk three times a week. So how do I start? I have my own exercise tips, and this is my regimen. I'd like to share this with you. You arrive at the airport as late as possible. <laughs> you carry massively heavy luggage with you, and you run for the plane. And if you do that three times a week, it will keep you fit and healthy. Now, in Illinois, they had their own ideas about how to do this. And what they said is, don't do that. Start with a 10-minute walk. Now, this is not a trudge. This is a brisk walk. It should be fast enough that you feel your pulse going up a little bit, but not so fast that you cannot speak. Okay, that's brisk. And then, the next week, do it 15 minutes. So you're adding five minutes every week. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes for one week. And then the next week, three times a week for 15. And then go up to 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40. Once you hit 40 minutes, three times a week, that's what works. Now you can do more. If you want to do more, that's great. But 40 minute brisk walk three times a week is what has been shown to reverse brain shrinkage. Now it's not just physical exercise. There's some evidence that mental exercises will help too. Not just any mental exercises. This comes from Canada. In Canada, but there are a fair number of people who are bilingual. And it turns out that bilingual people delay cognitive decline by about five years. And if a person has three languages, they do even better. So the belief is that there is something about really working the circuitry, particularly related to words and language in general, that helps preserve those circuits at least for a little bit longer period of time. Your high school French will not help you. Unless you're using it now. What happens is you, you have to be using it now for, for it to have any benefit, okay? So we have to do some activities. And I have my own intellectual activities that I'd like to, um, to suggest. Uh, documentaries, newspapers, read them all the time. Here's the one I read. And <laughs> dig into it, do all the puzzles. This would be very good for your brain. Um, crosswords, anagrams are very good. Uh, anything that involves words. Uh, and in fact, I was inspired by a lecture that Dean Ornish gave. Dean, you know Dean Ornish's work on, on heart disease? I was sitting in a, an auditorium and he, was, he showed this slide. He said, if I focus too much on me, if I focus on the I, I will be ill. But if I focus on the group, and I get the support of the group, and if I focus on we, I can be well. So his point was, get social support. And that's a really good point and a beautiful point. But while he was making that point, I was thinking about something completely different, which is, isn't that cool? There's words that are hidden inside other words, and maybe that's good for my brain if I find other words. So I take a word like this and I start rearranging them, and it's amazing what you can do for your brain if you just rearrange the letters a little bit. This is really good. Okay. So, trust me people, this is good for you. All right, so whether it's physical activity or mental activity, it is important to stop. You must stop. You cannot exercise forever. You can't push your brain forever. You have to stop and you have to rest, and you must sleep. Here's what's, at the beginning of the night, it's 10 o'clock, you went to sleep. If I put EEG leads on your head, an electroencephalogram, and I start recording your brain waves, what we see is something interesting. It's it, the first part of the night, it's slow wave sleep. That's when the brain is integrating words and facts, things that came to you over the course of the day. It's sort of like the brain is your desktop, and different people have been throwing notes and files all over the desktop. And when they finally leave, you can sort it out and put it somewhere where you can find it. The beginning of the night, your brain says, wow, all the things happened today. Let me just take some time and file it away. That's slow wave sleep. It's the filing process. The second half of the night, REM, you know about REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep? You're dreaming. And dreams have funny little emotions in them. That's when your brain is filing away emotions and restoring your emotional status, and also, also physical skills like tennis or playing a musical instrument or riding a bike, that's when the brain is, is integrating that. So, let's say you didn't sleep last night. 
What happens to your memory? Your memory is not very good. And particularly day after day after day, you'll, you'll find if you're not sleeping, your memory is no good, and your emotional control is not good. You'll get grumpy. And so, if you go on a cruise and you have a nice, quiet ocean surface, and you sleep really well, then you'll find your memory gets better and your emotional control gets better. All right? By the way, when you are asleep, your amyloid production, remember that sausage-making machine that's cranking up the amyloid strands in your brain, it shuts down at night unless you stay awake. If you stay awake all night long, your brain sausage maker, the beta amyloid producer, is running all night long, creating those beta amyloid plaques. Okay? Don't do that. Go to sleep. Become unconscious. It's a good thing to do every night. So, here's my most important medical tool. No matter how good your book is, no matter how good the documentary is on TV, at 10.00, turn it off and go to sleep. And you'll find that you start to feel more like kids. You know, with kids, they go to sleep at 8 o'clock at night. They wake up in the morning with boundless energy. They don't need a cup of coffee. They don't need a Red Bull. They feel great. Their memories are fabulous. And if we go back to kind of their lifestyle and remember what it was like to have sort of an unimpaired brain that has time to restore, you'll get that energy back and you'll feel it. Okay, there's more. Um, this is Dwayne Gravelin. Dwayne Gravelin was a physician, is a physician, and he was working for NASA. In fact, he was an astronaut in training. And one day, he drove home from NASA to his home in Florida. When he got to his house, there was a woman standing outside his door. And so he, he pulled into his driveway, and he got out of his car, and he, he went up to the woman. He said, Hi, I'm Dr. Gravelin. Can I help you with something? And she said, Dwayne, do you not recognize me? And he said, I'm Dwayne Gravelin. Have we met? She said, Dwayne, I'm, I'm your wife. She gets Dwayne in the car. They go to the emergency room, and they say, my husband has a big hole in his memory about me. And it turned out there were a lot of things he suddenly could not remember. And he flew into a panic, as did she. And they started to think, what had happened to him? They had a stroke? No, he didn't have a stroke. What was it? The only thing they could think of was that he had a high cholesterol level. And to treat his high cholesterol, he was taking Lipitor, which is a, a tort of a statin. It's, a, it's the most common statin. And, well, that, that should be safe, isn't it? It was only Lipitor. Well, maybe that affected his memory. Who knows? So they stopped taking the Lipitor, and his memory came back. Then, about three or four months later, his cholesterol was back up too. So he started the Lipitor at half the dose. And inside of a month, his entire memory was wiped out after age 13. Couldn't remember anything. The Lipitor went in the trash, and he wrote to the FDA. And his memory came back, by the way, uh, again. And they wrote to the FDA and said, I think we have an adverse event here that you should be aware of. And at first they said, wait, wait, Lipitor is a safe drug like all statins. Um, but they got hundreds of reports of people whose memories were faulty from Lipitor and other statins. Um, and Statins are very effective for lowering cholesterol, but they seem to affect the brain function in certain ways, and it's an uncommon side effect, but it does occur rarely that there are people who have statin-induced dementia. And I'm not suggesting that if you're taking a statin, you should throw it away. This is not common. And by and large, when you get your cholesterol down, that protects the brain. That's a good thing to do. But it is an unusual side effect that does happen, and the FDA now accepts it, and the list of side effects of statins include muscle problems, liver problems, uh, it increases the risk of diabetes, it causes weight gain, it causes rare cases of dementia, including people who were in nursing homes diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease who completely cleared up when they stopped their statin and they packed their bags and they went back home. Okay? So, I'm again not suggesting that medications don't have a purpose. But what I am suggesting is that we want to be very careful about them and we want to be attuned to medications and the risks that they pose. If you ever had a colonoscopy or some kind of procedure, and after the procedure, your friend is, or spouse is picking you up at the hospital and they're bringing you home, and they say, I hope it wasn't too bad. And you say, that's funny. The last thing I remember was coming into the hospital. 
And I, th I think I remember putting on the gown, but I don't have any memory of anything after that. The reason you don't remember is that when they gave you an IV, they gave you midazolam, which is intended to wipe out any memory of what occurred in the room while they were doing your procedure. And you might confront them well. You say, you might say, wait a minute, this is my brain. Why are you wiping out my memory banks? What they would say to you is, if you remembered your colonoscopy, you wouldn't think would come back for another one. It's really a good thing for us to just wipe it out. You don't want to reminisce about your coat about this. My feeling is it's fine to use that drug, but they should tell you that they are going to do this rather than keep it some kind of secret. Uh, Cholesterol-lowering drugs can affect the memory. Sleeping medication. Anybody ever take Ambien or you know anybody who did? It's amazing. Uh, when people take Ambien and related sleep aids, sometimes they wake up in the morning with signs that things have been awry in the night. It will cause sleepwalking, sleep driving, and people will get up in the mood to party. And they'll drive to the 7-Eleven and they'll come back with bags of barbecue potato chips and donuts and sodas and all kinds of things that are around their, their kitchen. And then when they wake up in the morning, the memory of it is completely gone. And they won't know how this could have happened. So be very, very careful if you're using these medications. And in Power Foods for the Brain, I have a whole chapter on how to get a good night's sleep without drugs because very often there are simple steps that you can take so you don't need these medications at all, okay? Um, so let's take our scorecard. Can I avoid bad fats? Yes. Can I? Easy. Uh, can I avoid excess metals like iron and, iron and copper? Sure I can. Uh, can I have vitamin-rich foods like vegetables and fruits? Sure I can. Uh, can I take vitamin B12? Yes. Um, can I get physical activity? Uh, maybe, if I schedule it. It's a thing people neglect, but it's good to bring it back in. Uh, mental stimulation, you're getting plenty of that already. Uh, can I get sleep? Work at it. Uh, be strict with yourself, you'll get a big payout. Can I be careful about medications, of course. So it's not that difficult to do. These are the steps that really protect the brain. We have lots of resources for you. Um, this is Power Foods for the Brain. I have lots of other books, and there are many, many books in the bookstore by other authors. And let me encourage you to check them out. There are tremendous uh, resources there. This is my new one. Um, just came out the other day. Uh, my book on reversing diabetes. This is a cookbook and that Drina Burton and I pulled together. And I want to brag about it. Um, we have our Kickstart program for people who would like online help. You get a fresh set of recipes and menus every single day for free for 21 days. You get it in, um, we have an app. And it's in several different languages including Mandarin, including uh, Spanish, and also one for people from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, for health professionals, let me encourage you to spend August with us. We're going to have a CME conference August 10th and 11th in Washington, D.C. And the last thing that I just want to share with you, when I was uh, a kid, my grandpa became demented. And at first, we just thought, that's grandpa. He would tell the same old story over and over and over and over again. And then my grandma became demented too. But eventually, it wasn't just telling the same stories, it was not knowing who any of us were, and not knowing who each other was. They don't die, the heart still beats, but the brain becomes totally unplugged. And then when my father started to have his brain sputter, and had more and more trouble controlling his emotions and understanding what was happening around him and eventually dying of this disease, we start to realize that this is affecting everybody, in every family, in every community, all around the world. It was quite understandable that we would think it's all old age, because that's when it seems to happen. But heart attacks happen in old age too. And it's not just, okay, you're 60, 70, you're 80, you're 90, time for your heart to die. No, it's accumulated damage that affects the heart, and accumulated damage can affect the brain too. Now, the body is a fragile thing, and things can go wrong with it, even if you do the very best kind of diet you possibly can. But in the same way as we treat our car really well, so it'll last as long as possible, we want to do the same for our heart, do the same for our brain. If we do that, hopefully families will be able to stay together a little bit longer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day.